Chapter 10 They picked up Jackson's truck from the body shop. The repairs were finished, and the vehicle looked like it had never been in an accident. A long drive later, they made it to the airport to pick up Katie's car. I don't like you driving that car, Jackson grumbled as they got out of his truck. It looks like it's going to fall apart at any moment. I have been driving it since I got a license, patiently responded Katie. She loved her car, even if it did look like it wasn't roadworthy. I will drive it until it dies. Or until it kills you, muttered Jackson as he grabbed Katie's luggage. She now had an extra suitcase that contained all her new clothes. I'm still going to follow you back until you are parked in your driveway. You can't always follow me around when I drive, Katie said wryly as she inserted her key in the door. Maybe not, but I can today. Jackson wondered why airport security hadn't called a tow on the eyesore. It would have been a favor to everyone if it was hauled to the junkyard. Katie just rolled her eyes. She was secretly thrilled that Jackson was worried about her, not that she was going to tell him that. Jerking open the car door, Katie gasped as she saw the interior. What on earth? Jackson coughed at the smell. My car! Katie exclaimed in horror. The stuffing of the seats was strewn all over the interior of the vehicle. Springs and foam remained where her seats had once been. The first aid kit had been torn open, instruments and gauze pitched here and there, bandages ripped apart, a chocolate bar wrapper left on the dash. The smell of animal permeated the car. What would do this? Katie tried to breathe through her mouth. I'm thinking raccoon, and I'm not sure that he made it out, Jackson grimaced. At the very least, the animal had used the car as a toilet for a few days. It wasn't pretty. On the bright side, the car was a wreck. Jackson almost smiled, but remembered to retain his serious attitude just in time as Katie turned her gaze to him. I can't drive it like this, Katie seemed a little in shock. Katie, it's time to give up the car. Jackson held out his hand for the keys. I will get the ownership papers and take off the license plates. We can get someone to tow it to the wreckers. Glumly, Katie gave him her keys. I'm going to miss Betty. You named it? Jackson didn't bother to hide his smile this time as he unlocked the passenger door to get to the glove compartment. Betty and I have gone through a lot together, Katie sniffed delicately. Her nose still smarted a little, and she didn't want to injure it any further. Jackson handed her the ownership paperwork, plus a few other things that were in the glove compartment that she might need. Katie didn't even bother to ask if Jackson had tools in his truck for taking off the license plates. She knew that most farmers carried around a simple set of tools for quick repairs. Why Betty? Jackson searched through a bag on the floor of the back seat of the cab of the truck, pulling out a screwdriver. Why not? She needed a name, and for some reason, Betty stuck, Katie responded, putting her suitcases back in Jackson's truck. Haven't you named your truck? Nope. Jackson shook his head. He figured it must be a girl thing. Tossing both plates into the truck, Jackson put the screwdriver back where it belonged. Nor do I ever intend to. It's a truck, not a puppy. It didn't take long to call a wrecker and donate the car for parts. While Katie wouldn't be getting any money for scrap, at least she didn't have to pay for it to be towed away. Katie wiped away a couple of tears, and Jackson wrapped an arm around her while the tow truck and Betty drove away. How about you drive my truck home? Jackson asked, hoping to cheer Katie up. No, thank you, Katie said firmly. Knowing my luck, I might hit another deer. The likelihood of that is pretty slim, Jackson responded, dangling the keys. No, I'm happy to let you drive. Katie gave him a quick kiss, then hopped into the truck. Smiling, Jackson shut her door, then proceeded to get in the driver's seat. It was late afternoon before they pulled into Pendle to get gas. Katie went in to talk to Judy at the gas bar while Jackson pumped the gas. He looked over Main Street to see if any changes had happened while they were gone, 
as Dixby Cooley pulled up at the gas station. Dixby? Jackson greeted the man. He and Dixby hadn't talked much since Dixby had become engaged to Melody. It wasn't that Jackson had unfriended the man, more that he was just not being as friendly since everyone knew that Brant, Jackson's friend, was in love with Melody. Jackson? Dixby had an easy smile, unfazed by Jackson's merely polite greeting. You've been away for a while. Hunting, right? I was, Jackson confirmed. He had been hunting for new fans for J.D. Emerson. Not that anyone needed to know that. Dixby took a quick look at the empty bed of the truck. Looks like you didn't catch anything. I caught something. Jackson had a smile of satisfaction. He decided not to elaborate. Ignoring safety warnings on the pump, Dixby leaned back against his old pickup as he pumped his gas. Have you heard about the Hawkins? Since you've been away, I wonder if anyone's told you the news. Jackson frowned. About them going under and filing for bankruptcy? I was here for that. I helped them move out of their home. I noticed you weren't there. Didn't seem like the best idea considering how things stand between Melody, Brant, and I, Dixby remarked with a grimace. However, I was busy doing something very important. I was getting Mr. Jake Ramsley lost and finding out his true motives for coming here to Pendle. Who? Jackson wasn't sure where this conversation was going. He glanced at the kiosk where Judy and Katie were chatting away. Jake Ramsley, the billionaire that Sarah Lee crashed a plane with? Dixby grinned. He and Sarah Lee had some unfinished business. What are you going on about, Dixby? Jackson sighed and frowned at the man. Dixby had a habit of drawing out stories in the most annoying way. He came to sweep Sarah Lee off her feet. Apparently it was partially his fault that the Hawkins couldn't make their payments last month. Jake felt bad, and he ponied up enough cash to buy back the Hawkins' farm and business, explained a satisfied Dixby. He's now a silent partner in their operation, and the factory is back at full steam. Everyone has their jobs back. Wow, Jackson couldn't believe it. That's amazing. That's good news for sure, Dixby grinned proudly. I expect Pendle is going to stay in town for the next while. Jackson wondered how Brant was taking this new development. He had been working so hard for so many years, and now his sister's boyfriend had swooped in to save the day. While he was probably happy the factory was back in business, Brant would no doubt feel a little resentment. It was only natural. Jackson wondered if that was why his friend hadn't called him to tell him about the matter. Excuse me, Dixby. Jackson finished and walked to the kiosk to pay for his gas. Judy greeted him as he came in the door. "'You two have been busy,' grinned Judy. "'I was just telling Katie how much I enjoyed watching Ruby the other day.' Jackson flushed a little. He wasn't exactly proud of their actions on the show. Then again, it had propelled them to finally confess their feelings for each other. And if Judy knew all about it, no doubt many others in town knew all about their stint on the daytime talk show. Judy told me Hawkins Fine Furniture Company is still in business, smiled Katie. Isn't that great? That means the daycare will stay open, and maybe I can get my job back. Are you sure you want your old job back? Jackson asked as he paid for his gas. I love working with the kids, Katie affirmed. She hoped that the daycare would hire her again. Besides, I still have bills to pay. You know, I would have thought that you would make a lot more money as an author. Judy mused as she gave Jackson his change. I hope you make more sales, Katie, dear. You need it with that car you're always driving. No worries, sighed Katie. The car is officially out of commission. It's now in the scrap heap. I will need to save up and get a new one. About time, Judy responded decisively. That car could have been the death of you. We'd best get going. Jackson smiled at Judy hoping to stop Katie from defending Betty. I have chores waiting. Good to see you both back, Judy called after them as they left. Thanks. Katie slipped her hand into Jackson's as they returned to the truck. Hi, Dixby. 
Hey, Katie. Dixby raised an amused brow as Jackson opened the passenger door for Katie. Dixby? Jackson gave the man a nod before getting in the truck. Maybe with the income from the daycare and your commission from J.D. Emerson, you can get a newer car and someplace decent to live. Hey, protested Katie as Jackson began to drive. I like it where I live. My friend Sylvie and her husband Neil are right next door. The rent is the cheapest in town, and if I really have to, I can walk to work. It's a dump, Katie. Jackson decided not to mince words. I don't think the area is particularly safe, either. Doesn't Brian Motts live there? Brian did his time and hasn't stepped out of line since, Katie responded. He's a nice guy if you get to know him. Jackson grunted. Not too many people knew much about Brian since he had gotten out of prison. He worked at the local hardware store and otherwise kept to himself. He killed a man, a cop. Something he's very sorry for, Katie replied tartly. He even talks to troubled teen groups in Buford. He doesn't want anyone doing what he did. What about Huey? Jackson grimaced. It was well known that Huey had sticky fingers. He had been in and out of jail several times for borrowing items without asking. He's a piece of work and lives at the end of the apartments. I don't talk to Huey. Besides, I don't think I have anything he would want to steal. Katie rolled her eyes. She might be right about that, Jackson supposed as he pulled into Katie's driveway. Still, it didn't mean it was a good place to live. Jackson knew it was far too soon in their relationship to talk about forever, marriage and moving in together, although he liked the idea of Katie in his home. He guessed that meant that he was going to have to put up with her choice of living arrangements for a while, or at least until he chose to get down on one knee and whisk her out of this place. Grabbing the suitcases, Jackson followed Katie to the door. I still think you should find some place at least a little better. I will even kick in part of the rent. I just want to make sure that you are safe. I'm perfectly safe. Katie frowned at him as she unlocked and opened the door. Immediately, a smell assaulted their nostrils. Whoa! Jackson dropped the luggage and covered his nose. Did your toilet puke or something? Katie tried not to gag as her eyes watered from the overpowering smell. She eyed a movement down the hall and grabbed Jackson's arm in alarm. We need to get out of here now. What? Why? he asked in confusion as Katie began dragging him back towards the truck. What is going on? Get in the truck, Katie tugged on him. What about your luggage? Jackson stumbled after her. Leave it. Katie tugged on the door handle. Unlock it. Jackson complied and Katie scooted into the vehicle, urging him to follow her. He closed the door of the truck, and they both stared at the apartment with the forlorn suitcases sitting at the doorway. Would you mind telling me what just happened? Wait for it, Katie said grimly, watching the door. I cannot believe my luck. Why do these things always happen to me? Raw sewage? guessed Jackson. It was probably coming down her hallway in slow motion like a horror movie. Do you want to call your landlord? Katie turned to face him, suddenly serious and a little worried. Are you sure, Jackson, about us? I do love you, but I also know that you're setting yourself up for a lifetime of this. Burnt suppers, small fires, total vehicles, overbleached tie-dyed shirts, scrapes and broken bones. Just general bad luck things. It can be a little much at times. Katie? Jackson smiled and took her hand. I'm with you for the long haul. I know exactly what I'm getting into, and I still love you. Good. Katie answered with a smile of her own, relaxing in relief. I need a new place to live for a while. It's just temporary until the smell is out of my apartment. You can move in with me. I have a spare bedroom. Jackson offered readily. Secretly, he was pleased by the prospect. He hoped her apartment continued to stink for a long time. What will your mom say? Katie wondered, a little worried over the prospect. She liked Donna and didn't want to get on her bad side. 
Once she gets over the idea of you being with me instead of Trent, I'm sure she'll be happy. Jackson pulled Katie a little closer. Now, tell me, what did you see in the apartment that had us hightailing it for the truck? Katie glanced back at the door. That. Jackson followed her gaze, and there was a skunk blinking in the bright sunlight on the front step. It sniffed at one of Katie's suitcases. You're kidding me. Jackson said in disbelief as he watched the little creature begin rubbing on the suitcase. First a raccoon, and now a skunk. Living with me is never dull, commented Katie. Isn't he cute? And stinky. How did it get into your apartment? he questioned, not really expecting an answer. How did the raccoon get into the car? shrugged Katie. Life's great mysteries. You're taking this really well. "'Jackson noted. "'I could cry, but what would that do?' she asked wryly. "'My apartment stinks, and now so do all of my clothes. "'I have no car and no job. "'This could be a new low for me.' "'You have me,' Jackson reminded her. "'Then I suppose everything is perfect.' "'Katie smiled as she gave him a kiss. "'A few days later.' Jackson typed rapidly on his laptop. He was happily ensconced in the living room with the fireplace burning, and Katie leaning against him as she read a book out of his mom's collection. They were both surprised when the back door opened, and Donna appeared with her luggage. "'You're home early,' Jackson remarked, saving his document and shutting the laptop. "'How was the cruise?' "'They had to close down the kitchen for salmonella, but otherwise it was great!' Donna looked tan and happy. Hi, Katie. Hi, Mrs. Davis. Katie responded in return, putting down her book. It's Donna, she corrected Katie patiently. I think it's more than past time you call me by my given name. Someone showed me that Ruby episode that the two of you were on. Katie flushed a little. Jackson merely took Katie's hand in his. When's the wedding? Donna grinned happily. Jackson groaned. One thing at a time? It's a little early for that. Donna raised an eyebrow. Really? Because I was told in town that during my absence, Katie has moved in. I can answer that, Katie interjected quickly. While we were on the book tour, a skunk somehow managed to get into my apartment. Animal control was able to release the poor thing, but it did spray my living room. So, yes, I have been living here, in the guest bedroom. It's just until the smell goes away. It's compromising your reputation, dear, Donna commented to Katie. She knew she was laying it on a little bit thick, but maybe Jackson would get the hint that she wanted a wedding and babies for her son. Mom, this is not the 1950s, Jackson responded wryly. I'm sure most people are happy for us and don't care about the living situation, even though it has been entirely above board. I'm happy for both of you. It's no secret that I wanted Katie for a daughter-in-law. Donna gave Katie and Jackson each a hug. I would just like to know when the wedding is and when I can expect grandbabies. When we're ready, he rolled his eyes. Katie just smiled. With her luck, it would probably be sooner than he thought. Donna sat down on the ottoman to face the two of them. Now, I have a bone to pick with the two of you. I hosted that book club, and neither of you saw fit to tell me that Jackson was J.D. Emerson. Katie flushed. How did you know? wondered Jackson. Really, Jackson? I'm not blind. Donna huffed indignantly. I knew you were doing something on the side to keep our finances up so well, and we all know that farms aren't paying right now. Either you have to be huge corporations to get the amount of volume it takes to make money, or you're supplementing income from another source in today's farming community. I had no idea that you were writing books until I saw the episode on Ruby, and everything clicked in my mind. Mom, I was going to tell you, admitted Jackson relieved to be able to confess the truth to her. Actually, I was going to ask you to be the face of J.D. Emerson for the book tour. Then you were invited on the cruise. You were so excited to go, so I asked Katie instead. 
She had just lost her job and needed another source of income. The book tour wasn't all that much fun anyways, Katie informed Donna. It was frightening talking to so many people. How many other people know, wondered Donna. Only you, Katie, and I, Jackson replied quickly. I would like to keep it that way. Donna felt a little disappointed that she couldn't brag about her son's accomplishments. However, she could understand that he might not want everyone to know that he was a romance author. Jackson wouldn't respond well to the teasing. Yet he would get over it. Fine. I guess it will be enough to be able to say that my son is dating J.D. Emerson. I'm dating Katie, Jackson corrected her. I know, and I'm so excited for you both. Donna leaned forward to grab them both in a hug yet again. She released them and stood. Now, I will have to just find someone for Trent. Jackson watched his mother grab her suitcases, rolling them towards her bedroom. He called after her. I'm sure Trent is able to find a girl on his own. You don't know that, she called back to him. Trent might find a city girl, and that wouldn't do. He needs someone from the area so that he will stick around, and I can visit any grandbabies he gives me. Jackson rolled his eyes. Katie grinned. I think it's great that your mom is matchmaking. Trent won't think so, drawled Jackson. If I know him, he won't be impressed at all. He might be surprised. Katie took Jackson's hand. She knew I was a good catch, even if she had me picked out for the wrong son. Well, then, perhaps she's right. Jackson smiled and gave Katie a quick kiss. I would hate to do Trent a wrong turn by discouraging Mom from matchmaking for him. It could be fun to see who she comes up with, Katie replied. When does Trent come home? Christmas break, Jackson confirmed before kissing Katie again. Hi, my name is Josephine Bintema, and I write sweet romance and cozy mysteries. I want to thank you very much for listening to my books. There is also an epilogue to this one, which is coming out soon, and I hope you find it and enjoy it as well. Again, thank you, because without you, I wouldn't be able to do this. Take care, and happy listening!